do a little bit of a welcoming as people are trickling in. Just do a little recap on previously on the Emergency Battery Collab. We talked about thinking in community. We, thought, we talked about emphasizing the importance of community involvement and collective action, something that we all know very well. And now really grounding when we're thinking about battery, how do you think in community, even with something as technical as energy? How do we think outside of the cold box? We're here together to think outside of these boxes. And last session, we talked about thinking in community, being outside of the cold box, talking about social issues are also emergencies, not just these weather issues. It's not just these things about our surrounding environment, but the condition of our people, ourselves, are also an emergency. And with the importance of stimulating community people and community resources is all we're doing today or in this class. And we also talked about communities look very different ways. So a big takeaway question from the last session was, what does your community look like? And we had put on the Canvas space for those who had the chance to get on Canvas to really share a little bit about what your community looks like. And so we can also think about how do we prioritize what is classified as an emergency in your community. I wanted to take a moment for those who already arrived here, hello, welcome, to if you want to take a moment to just kind of say like, what does your community look like as we're waiting for folks to join in? And if you can just start with your name, where you're calling in from, and what your community looks like as we are transitioning from thinking in with community to today's session. Yes, Robin. Yeah, I'm uh, Robin Harris. I'm in Orlando, Florida, and more specifically, I'm in the area called Orla Vista is where it got really hit hard by Hurricane Ian last season. Community is Black, Brown, Guyanese, Haitian, uh, that particular area, a lot of undocumented people, um, LGBT, you know, QIA, uh, under uh, low income, under income, under working people. Um, and so they were impacted all kinds of ways, employment, food loss um, because of power outages. Uh, most of the impact, yes, it came from the hurricane because of severe flooding, but then days after, um, because of the power outages, people lost food. Um, some people are still displaced. So we're just impacted in intersectional ways. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Robin, and thank you for being here. We got us, and we're going to take care of each other. Anyone else wants to share? Yes, Eugene. Yes, uh, Columbus, Ohio, and um, I live in a district maybe about five miles north of downtown, which was um, uh, built in the 1920s, the homes. So it's a lot of older craftsman style homes and um, younger people are moving in after the original owners have passed on. And so it's it's a good diverse mixture, although I'd say 80, 85% Caucasian, um, but progressive community. Um, we voted today, as you probably know, for Ohio's um, uh, amendment to uh, they wanted to amend the constitution to make it harder for citizen initiatives um, to pass so hopefully that goes our way and we'll know by 10 p.m tonight <laughs> fingers crossed thank you for sharing eugene do we have any one last person want to share as we transition away from last week yes son hi my name is son um I would say that my community looks like probably even more formed over COVID since COVID began. It's become a little bit more global and online based. Um, so I'm originally from Kenya. So I have uh, primarily community, what's consistent across the community, even if it's in Jamaica or Kenya or Baltimore, Oakland. Um, 
Atlanta and Chicago is it's all like black queer people who are committed to caring for each other. Um, a lot of people are developing like maybe they're artists. Most of them are working class, like maybe around minimum wage, um, but also creatives. Uh, and then a lot of them now are getting into farming, gardening and finding ways to like provide for each other as the climate continues to degrade um, around like ranging from maybe like 18, I'm 26, but like 19 to 30 is around the age of like black, queer and trans folks. So it's been a cool community. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for everyone else for also sharing that in your heart, thinking about your community as you're hearing from Robin, Eugene, and Sun. This is such a huge diversity of different types of communities we're all bringing in here with us as we're thinking about how to actually bring some shared knowledge moving forward. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Yasir, but I wanted to check real quick if Yasir is um, ready. Just wanna pause and do a little check on our fellow speaker. Yeah, we should, yes. should be good here. Oh yeah, great, great. okay. <laughs> Um, sorry, get my camera set up here. Um, welcome. So thank you for going over the homework, uh, Crystal. And thank you everyone who shared where you guys are from and what your community looks like right now. It's uh, really exciting to hear some of that. I wish we could hear more. Um, and hopefully people aren't sh shy to share, but we're gonna go ahead and hop into what we have here to cover today. So we wanted to, to take a moment just to speak to everyone and make sure everyone understands that um, the three of us represent uh, a portion of just the Bay Area uh, Battery Collective. So we got together in 2020, and I think I was late to the game. You guys started before me. I'm not sure exactly how many months before me, but um, you guys got to deal with all the uh, bureaucracy and stuff like that. So when I came in, I came in for the fun, for the nuts and bolts, organizing people, getting people together. Um, uh, thank you. I'm just reading the, the chat that popped up there. So we got together with just... Um, really wanting to provide a service for the community um, and individuals of the community who were in hard places uh, or hard hit by either natural disasters um, that we could do something impactful or unnatural disasters um, such as uh, PG&E here in California. We have a Pacific Gas and Electric is our, our gas and electric company um, just to try to provide other options for people. So in doing that, we worked out a lot of different bugs. Um, we jumped through a lot of hoops just to try to figure out what's the easiest way, uh, one, to build a battery, uh, two, to be able to set up a network of individuals who care enough to try to uh, maintain the batteries, to share the batteries, to find individuals and to be able to communicate, um, you know, how can, how can someone get a battery if they need one? Um, it takes time. So I wanna make sure everyone understands that it takes time, it takes energy. Um, we're here today because the three of us are here today because we would like to, to pass this information on. Uh, we don't believe in uh, hoarding knowledge. We don't believe in having something and calling it our own. Um, certain things belong to individuals, I guess our, uh, our souls. Um, and then other things belong uh, not to an individual, uh, but more to a collective. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen right now in the world uh, where people get charged like money for basic needs, like things that we need to survive. Um, a lot of those things historically have been free, the communal things. They weren't commodities. So uh, water. You know, you'd have a well, the entire village had rights to the well. There was no dispute about that. People didn't have to flip coins, didn't have to pay. Like all of those things is, is really bizarre how they've changed over time. Same thing with energy. Um, 
I don't think they charge for air yet, but I'm sure that's probably coming soon. Um, but just, I, we wanted to make sure everyone understands that we're here to try to give information to provide you guys with what we have gone through, what we've suffered through, so you guys don't have to do the same suffering. Uh, hopefully creating a shortcut for some individuals here who want this information. Um, we don't get anything out of this other than trying to give back what we believe um, belongs to everyone here on this call. Uh, there's no um, hierarchy. <laughs> we're all here, we're all sharing. There's information that you guys have shared already that uh, we've benefited from and we're gonna continue to benefit from. So we appreciate that. Uh, if you guys do have a, a cover charge for that, let us know uh, via chat. Uh, if not, we'll assume it's all communal information. Um, and that's it. I think uh, the last thing that we all wanted to do is just make sure that we clearly ask for permission to share that information with everyone. Uh, we don't want to make any assumptions. We don't want to. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we'll just read the chat. Uh, we don't want to make any assumptions. We just want to make sure it's it's clear and everyone understands what our intentions are and those what I just named are our intentions. And that's why we're here. So. Um, Yeah, and I think just to wrap it up again, I, I'll just reiterate that we are asking for permission to be able to share this information with you, you all uh, and that you guys trust that the reason that we're doing it is what we just said, which is to uh, continue to keep communal information, communal information. Uh, the information that we share, we would hope that the people who hear it will take that information and share it also. That would be great. Um, and any flaws that we make, we apologize for ahead of time. Uh, yeah, and with that, I think I'll hand it off to Crystal. Did I miss anything? Crystal, Candace? No, you're good. And for today is session three. We're going to be talking about understanding batteries. And so what we're gonna be doing for the next 45 minutes remaining is to gain knowledge about batteries, their management and usage within the battery collective or emergency community backup power supply that we are going to start together in your community. So to start, we're gonna play a little game and I'm gonna share my screen here. And the game is called How Much Energy Game. Why do we need to talk about how much energy? Because we need to know how much we put in the battery. We have to think about, it's kind of like, I like to think of battery planning, emergency planning, kind of like packing. Like when we have emergency situation, we have to have a go bag, right? It's kind of like when you're going to going camping, you need to know how much food you're going to bring, how much water you're going to bring, how much what kind of clothes and tools and whatever things, entertainment things that you might need. These are the things that you have to prepare for. And so the same thing when we're preparing for energy, we have to know how much energy, but most of the time, we just kind of mindlessly consuming energy. So a big part about being part of creating an emergency battery, a community battery power supply is to understand our relationship with energy. So what this means is we're going to understand what energy means. And in front of you, we will see uh, seven appliances. And we're going to play a game together as a big group. And so if you can go off mute, since I only see people who are turning their camera on. So if you want to participate, we'll need you to go off mute and yell out things. The game here is let's guess. What do you think it uses the most energy out of all of the seven appliances that's probably in your house? And you probably need to use it when you don't have power. Fridge. What? Fridge. Okay, yeah. we got Robin who gets fridge is the, most, uh, is the most energy intensive out of the seven. Anyone else have a different guess? I could be wrong. No, no. Yeah, it's okay. Depending we'll on the hair dryer, I think that's it pulls a lot of electricity. Okay, we got a little depending on the hair dryer, maybe hair dryer, tiny little hair dryer might be more than fridge. Moda. Any other guesses? Any other guesses? Uh, modem, I think was said. Modem, right? Modem. 
Okay, another guess is the modem. So powerful, right? It's powering so much things. We're getting connected to people all across the planet. Modems got to have lots of energy. Any other guesses? Kettle. Kettle. Okay, kettle, it's hot water. Creator of the hot water, turning from cold water into hot water. It's got to have energy. We got another guess there. Any Anything else we have? Any other guess before we start jumping in and see what exactly the answer is? There you go, right? Oh, sorry, yes, you? I was just saying the hair dryer. I guess it depends on how much uh, hair you have, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right. How much hair, too, yeah. Oh, I also see in chat. Oh, we got people voting for kettle. Kettle. Um, and that fan probably takes a lot too. Yeah, we also got Depending a fan. Depending on the size of it, the real size of it. I mean, yes. I think fridge is probably the most, but then those little appliances like the kettle and the fan, if you put those in incorrectly, you can blow a fuse in your entire building, in your entire apartment. So they can draw a lot of energy, the fan and the kettle. You can't blow a fuse with a laptop or with a smartphone or with a modem, but you can blow out a lot of stuff with a fan and a kettle Thanks and maybe that. a hair dryer. But I think that that would be the third of those three. I would go fan, kettle, hair dryer, but of course, fridge first. And kettle, hair dryer, fridge first. All right, great. Thanks for that, Calvin. That was awesome. Little analysis. We also got, um, I see in chat, we got fridge, fridge, computer. Um, all right, well, in general, okay, let's see, space heater, anything with heating element, oh man. Okay, so now let's check something else. Since I've heard so much about fridge, we have to click the fridge. How much is the fridge exactly? Oh, shoot. Sorry, I click on the, the fan by accident. I think I click on the fan by accident or, <laughs> sorry. So the fan is 65 watts. Now, a lot of you would be like, how do you even measure energy? Uh, like what is a lot? Is 65 a lot or is that very little? So I guess fan would be a good place to start. And plus fan was being said, maybe fan is a lot. So 65 watt is a fan. I hope we're able to get, okay. So now going to the fridge. That's a lot of people are guessing the fridge. How high is the fridge? The fridge is 800 watts. Yes, it is high, 800 watts. So to think about the fridge, what is the fridge? The fridge is not just this magical box that just turns things cold. It has physics behind it. It's this really highly insulated box that has a compressor that turns, use physics to turn uh, room temperature into cold air and uses fan to move the air from your kitchen probably is where your fridge is, but you can put your fridge anywhere you want. I don't care, I won't judge. We move the air from whatever room is and go into that box and keep the cold in. If you think about your fridge, the fridge is mostly sitting there quietly. Sometimes maybe once in a, once an hour, it will ramp up. That's when the compressor's running, that's when the fan's running, and that's when the energy's being drawn out. Because of the fridge does not move, does not turn on so much, but it's still, it, it doesn't actually draw energy all the time. But when it does, it's a lot. So we get 800 watts. But right now we only saw 800 watts and 65. So we also heard, um, let's say Wi-Fi was also a guess that I remember. Let's just go to Wi-Fi. Just a kind of gauge of what exactly things look like. Oh, Wi-Fi modem is seven watts. So thinking about what exactly these things that we rely on is doing. Here we have this tiny little box that's sitting on the side in some room that's connecting, that's, that's con turning some, some um, communication information. Yes, here, I hope I'm explaining this accurately. <laughs> turning some information through some wire that's connecting to the little box. And then it will shoot out Wi-Fi that all your devices will pick up. And because it uses just like these lights you see, think about what the Wi-Fi uh, modem looks like. It's got LED lights. LED is very efficient. You don't have incandescent light bulb on your modem. So it's only seven watts. And compare that with the fan. The fan is, a, is an electric motor that turns 
these blades around, of course, depends on the size, it might be different, but all it's doing is spinning. So we get six to five watts. But now we have people who are talking about hair dryer. Obviously, it depends on how much hair you have. If it's crystal mm -hmm. using it versus yes, you're using it, we're going to be using different amount of energy. But even just, just the, the um, appliance itself, we're now talking about a hair dryer that turns air from the room temperature into hot air. It has something that turns it hot and also a fan that blows it out very fast to my hair. And so now we have 1,300 watts. We also have people, so now I think somebody mentioned, a few people, a couple of people have mentioned things that had heating components. We use out a lot of electricity. So we got kettle also, 1,500 watts. That because all it's doing is it's resisting, it's slowing down the electron, 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 electrons from moving. So it heats up the metal. And when the heat, it uses the, the electrons heating up to heat up the air for air uh, hair dryer or the water for your kettle. So knowing how much it uses then actually helps you understand the spec for your battery. Now, I think everyone seems to get a sense like no matter how much we rely on these amazing computers like the laptop and our tiny little phones, they actually don't use a whole lot of energy. There's quietly sitting there except mine right now is sounding like an airplane about to take off, mm -hmm. but it doesn't use up that much energy compared to the fridge or, or definitely not the hot water heater. So 100 watt for the laptop and then for the smartphone to charge it, it's only six watts. So this um, hopefully gives you some idea and understanding of what some appliances, how to be in relationship with your appliances instead of just blindly using it, instead of just grab my glass and drink it and not even think about it. I think, what is this glass doing? Or this, this um, cup doing for me? It is holding water and using in re relationship with gravity. I tilt my glass and the water will pour out. So being conscious of the relationship with the things that we, we, we rely on is also being conscious of the things that we're in community with, not just the people, not just the living beings. So being conscious of it is one really important piece of understanding what are we preparing to actually understand how much is how much energy we need in our community. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up this how much energy game and see if there's any questions before I pass over to Yasir to then talk about the box of the little battery. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes, Stephanie. So so when you give us the wattage, is that per hour, per minute? How do I gauge this? Like it takes an hour to charge my phone. Is that six watts an hour? That's a great question. Um, then yesterday is about to get into that. Would you like to just handle that? Oh, I can oh. wait. Okay, great. I'll also see a hand from Arietha. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Arietha. Arietha, beautiful name. Thank you. I want to, um, are there different batteries for different items? Like if some items are high surge and some are low, like passive, do you use like different types of uh, batteries for them or you can use the same? Uh, if you're going to get into that later, no problem. These are yeah, really great questions. Yeah, yes, yeah. If we can, uh, let's table those and then I can, if someone can write them down and then at the end of the, the session, the section we're about to go into, then I can touch on those. Or the second one, the first one I can just answer right now and say, yes, when you see an appliance and it has a wattage rating on it, that's wattage per hour. So the standard is it'll give you a wattage per hour. Um, so if you see six watts, you can assume it's six watts per hour. Also, they were they you might hear the term called watt hour, which is the same thing. Yeah. Um, so if you if you if you run the the fan for an hour, you basically let me just go. We run the fan for an hour, sixty five watt hour. If you run for two hours, you multiply that by two. So that's basically the unit of energy. 
Um, obviously, we're simplifying this a whole lot because we don't want to get too much into the physics of things that you can probably very easily find on the internet. We're trying to really focus our, our learning um, objective into how do we really think in community when it comes to these um, technical things as well. So if you don't feel like your answer, your question has been answered, please hold on to them because we're definitely going to get to them even more, especially now we're gonna get into the battery basic. Then uh, that means I need to figure out how to jump to that slide. And while you're doing that, um, yeah, someone posted in the, in the chat the answer, because I think the question was which one uses the most? For the oh energy. yeah, do we have the answer? <laughs> you just saw all the numbers, but what is an actual answer? The answer is kettle, I think. Yeah. It's all the things that create heat because it slows down electrons from moving. So it's important. I hope this is also, this is also a fun exercise for you to think about what are these things that you're relating with. It could also be used as an exercise with your community that you were thinking last week about who are your community and maybe having an exercise like what do you think uses the most energy like and you that. know what what could also be a consideration is what provides the greatest value so a refrigerator can hold formula can hold medicine can hold food so that's important and then what they call command and control. So the items which enable you to communicate your phone. And if you have a phone and a laptop, you might get more use out of your phone and save wattage from the laptop. So the triage of creating command and control capabilities so you can contact first responders who of course have their own agenda, but like with an emergency, like if you're doing CPR, the first thing you do is move a crowd away. You see what the status of the individual is, and then you have someone who's there go and get help. So having that phone charged is a way to get help. And to have that refrigerator available will provide certain things for individuals. Again, food, maybe medicine, maybe formula, and it might keep from other things happening. Like if it begins to melt ice, now you have like an issue where you've got like melting things, you know, and you're, you know, now you've got ice cubes that are melting, you've got stuff that's thawing out, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just me thinking down the road. So great. Thank you, Kelvin. Yeah, thank you for that. I think um, that kind of just so everyone knows, like um, the homework from last week was what does your community look like? A lot of things when we start thinking larger and like applications um, like uh, Kelvin was just sharing, it really depends on what your community looks like. So you could have a community that needs heat where the refrigerator is not that important or the things in the refrigerator can go outside, outdoors. Things in the refrigerator can go in a crawl space. Um, just what we really wanna try to do is make sure we encourage thinking outside of the box. And that's a, probably a term that we'll probably continue to use. Um, or as uh, Crystal says, thinking outside of the ice box. Um, so where if you do have a long-term situation where you need to keep food cold, um, again, like traditional, knowledge tells us that uh, where uh, food was stored before where it was in the ground, uh, ground temperatures are somewhere in the area about 54 degrees, which is uh, Fahrenheit, which is pretty cold. So your refrigerator is like 43. So you can actually dig a hole, put your food inside of there, and it will stay cold and stay good, perfectly fine food. Um, looking at the, the game that Crystal just shared with us regarding like the heating element, the, um, the kettle or sometimes a space heater, when you look at those items and you see that, uh, you know, 1500 watts um, and you're looking for a battery unit that's going to, 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 to power that, understand when you see the wattage of the power unit, how those two things relate. And we're gonna kind of get into that uh, 
right now. So you can say, great, I have this power unit. What can I do with it? What can I, can I do with it? What can I do with it? What I can plan for um, and how to the triage to um, the Kelvin's point there. Uh, am I pronouncing your name right, Kelvin? Yes, like the degree scale, Kelvin, K-E-L-V-I-N. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know what the ground temperature would be in Kelvin, but to look that up. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, we're gonna go into some battery basics. Um, if you have a pen and if you have a paper, if you're stationary, um, you may wanna take notes. This section's a little dense. Uh, it's probably gonna be the most dense section of the entire course. Um, so I apologize ahead of time for people who don't like uh, density. <laughs> so, um, so essentially these are just as the basic components of, of if you're gonna build your own battery or even if you purchase a battery off the shelf, that's gonna, you're gonna use the power devices uh, remotely um, or disconnected from the grid, off grid. So you'll need a source. So you'll need a way to recharge the battery. Um, solar is a popular source. Uh, plugging into a wall is a popular source. Um, a car, you can use a car to recharge a battery. Um, that is a source that will recharge a battery. Um, you can use a bicycle. There's like uh, uh, a lot of different ways. Bicycle, hydro, if you have a creek or something like that on your property, um, or a steady flow of water that's moving from a high location to a low location. You can put a, a DC turbine, a little DC motor on that. And as it spins, it will generate electricity and that can charge a battery as well. Um, wind, uh, it works in a very similar way uh, as, as water, where you just uh, you know take a DC motor, hook it up to some blades. Um, and as that turns, that will generate electricity that can charge a battery as well. Um, so just different ways there uh, that you can do it. When I was a little younger, our bicycles, we didn't have these little LED lights. We had these uh, little uh, DC motors that would attach to your wheel. And whenever you wanted a light, you'd click a button and that would run against the wheel and that would generate your light working. So the faster that you, rode your bike, the brighter the light would be. And then when you slow down, it goes uh, dim. Um, so that was straight from a DC motor to a light, to a DC light that would light up. Um, we could replace that light with the battery. It would recharge a rechargeable battery also. So just things to think about. Um, number one was a source. Number two, what's called a charge controller. Um, charge controller, what that does is it, uh, takes whatever the energy is that's coming in. And I'll use the example that I just gave about riding my bicycle. So if I rode my bicycle faster, the light would get brighter. And if I slow down, um, the light would get more dim. The reason that happens is because the amount of current that's coming through. So faster, higher current, brighter light, great. Slower, not so much energy is coming through. So it's, it's lower. What a charge controller does is it regulates that and it takes that energy and then sends it to your battery at a steady rate. So your battery doesn't um, go berserk, essentially. So a charge controller. Um, the next thing you need is a battery, place to store. So now you have this energy coming in, it's going through a charge controller, it's being cleaned. Um, and now what you need a place to store that energy, and that would be the battery. And we're going to get into batteries right after this. Um, there's different types of batteries that we'll go over. And the fourth thing you need is what's called a load, um, how you're gonna discharge it. So you've saved this energy, you've stored it, what are you gonna use it for? Um, and that's where I put community next to that. Um, so that could be discharged in a physical way, such as you know taking the battery somewhere, plugging something into it, powering a light bulb, uh, powering a refrigerator, um, powering a microphone. Uh, it could also be uh, discharged in other ways, like uh, spiritual ways, uh, which is just like what we're doing now. Like we're not actually discharging anything, but we're just talking about uh, the energy that's stored um, in a way where 
it's it's being utilized. There is a load. It is building community. It is bringing people together. We are trying to come together and have a, a general understanding. So just different ways to think about how that um, load um, or where that energy is going. Any questions about those four before we move on? I'm going to ask if there's questions because, again, this is a, a dense section here. There are no dumb questions here. I have a question. Is this as in depth are you going to go in regards to like how the battery works or are you going to go in more detail later or is this like as much as you think we we need to know? It's um, thank you. That is a good question. This is as basic as this is, is as basic really as it is. Um, we can complicate it with a lot of other things, which I'm trying not to do. Um, but we are going to also have like a resource section for people who like to get deeper into it and learn more about it. Uh, we, we will have a section on that. So right now we're just going to talk about this is an overview. This is the basic components you need. If you can gather these components, you can probably build a, a decent battery to do a lot of different things. Um, this is the same exact components. If you have a home solar system, you have uh, 10,000 kilowatts on your roof. These are the same things it needs. Sun, somewhere, you know, a source, it's gonna need a charge controller, which they call inverters, which they put inside of your garage. Um, and then it needs a battery. If you're gonna be off grid, needs a place to store the energy and then it needs a load, your, all your equipment inside of your house. Uh, if you have an RV, same thing, anything that's off grid follows the same parameters here. So it's basic, but it is, it is basic. <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna keep it there. In fact, it's so basic that this is also the component of an um, entire microgrid. It's also an entire, uh, the component of our entire electricity grid. It's just yeah. creating that loop of electricity. Yeah. And again, whether you're talking hydro or talking wind or talking solar, this is, uh, these are the components here. Or dirty energy. Or dirty energy. <laughs> so uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna fly through these. Kind of quickly. So we talked about batteries on the previous slide. There's three main type of batteries that people kind of are familiar with and use. Um, there's a what's called a lead acid battery. If you have a car, uh, a non-electric car, uh, a gas vehicle, or a propane vehicle, or a hydro electric vehicle, they all have um, lead acid batteries underneath the hoods. For the majority of them, unless you upgrade to an AMG battery. Um, which is um, also uh, a lead acid battery. It's just a different type of lead acid battery. And we'll get into that on the next slide. This slide is, is put here more for reference. So something for us to come back to or the, the group to come back to if they want a kind of a breakdown. Um, lead acid um, batteries do have the most maintenance. Um, 200 bucks to get you a lead acid battery. Uh, and this will show the charge time here. It also shows cycles, which means how many times you can discharge that battery and recharge it. Um, 300. Uh, an AMG battery, you can discharge and recharge 500 times. The price is about twice that of a lead acid battery. Um, the reason for the price difference is because of the maintenance goes down with the AMG battery. Um, you don't have to worry about AMG batteries leaking. Um, However, they do off gas. So that's something to be concerned about if you're gonna store it in a confined space, they need to be vented. So they need to have airflow. Um, those are on the next slide, the, all this information as well. And then lithium, um, and we're kind of gonna go more into lithium. Lithium is kind of like the new thing, newer thing of the three that a lot of people are excited about, uh, lithium batteries. Um, and you can see why 3000 plus cycles, it, the run times are the longest. Um, how long they last as far as their lifespan is 10 plus years. They're virtually maintenance free. Um, and there's a question in chat, are all of these car batteries? No, lead acid uh, usually are using cars, AMG are using cars. Lithium batteries would be your, uh, what do you call these newer cars? Electric vehicles. So like your, your Teslas or your, I think all the manufacturers have electric vehicles now. So Ford, Chevy, VW, 
they all have an electric vehicle. So your EV is going to be the lithium there. Um, next slide. Uh, lead acid batteries, a couple of things I'm just pointing out here that I think I've already said these are the cheapest upfront. So they have the lowest cost, but they do have the highest maintenance. Um, compared to lithium batteries, you're going to be spending over the lifespan four to six times the amount um, over a 10 year span. Uh, next slide. AMG batteries, somebody put this in chat already, but they stand for absorbent glass matte batteries. Uh, they use fiberglass inside of them to, to store the lead acid. Um, that fiberglass absorbs that and has a slower discharge rate, which, um, which is why people kind of like the a, uh, AGMs because they don't spill. Like if you have them on their side, you don't have to worry about the, um, the acid coming out or the water coming out of the battery. And you don't have to worry about refilling them either. Next slide, lithium batteries. Again, lithium batteries, uh, I don't actually want to repeat anything I've said already. Uh, they're most cost efficient if you're looking at over a 10 year span, how much you're going to be um, spending on them. So if you're making a decision about what you're going to use for battery storage, right now lithium battery uh, is an option, a long term option. Next slide. Uh, pen and paper. Do we have a volunteer already? All right. I thought I heard his mic come off mute. So we're going to go just briefly over what a watt hour is. And I think Crystal's game actually played right into this. So um, essentially, there's a formula here that if you want to write down, I'd suggest you write it down. It's A times B equals W, which is amps times voltage equals wattage. Um, there's a second formula that you may want to write down, which is W divided by V equals A. So watts divided by voltage equals your amperage. Uh, I give both of these formulas because when you buy devices, sometimes they'll tell you the wattage and it's very easy. Just look at the sticker and say, hey, that's, that's my wattage. This is what I'm going to be using per hour. Sometimes it doesn't. It just gives you the amperage. Um, it'll give you the voltage that it runs at and the amperage. And using this formula, you can figure out what the wattage is yourself. Um, so uh, if you have an 100, and this just goes what we kind of talked about before, if you have a 100 watt light bulb and you're going to use it for one hour, uh, it will consume 100 watts. So very basic. Uh, two hours, I'm sure everyone can do that math in their head. What was that? Okay. And then for amp hours, if you have a 100 watt light bulb to be used for, thank you for the answer. <laughs> if you have a 100 watt light bulb, um, and you use it for one hour, it will consume 8.6 amps. So if you use that for two hours, very simple, you just double that is what you would have for your answer there. Uh, again, the reason why I'm pointing out this, when you purchase batteries, sometimes they're listed as watt hours and sometimes they're uh, listed as amp. Oh, this is a 200 amp hour battery. So now you know what that means and why you would need that information. Sometimes it's listed as wattage. This is a 2000 watt battery and you'll have to go, okay, what the hell does that mean? Um, this way you can distinguish the two and you, your question is like at the very bottom, what you need to know is how many watts your devices use. So if you have that information or if you have the amperage that your devices use, you can figure out how you're gonna size your battery based off of that. Uh, how do we know what watt something may have? Um, on how do we, I don't understand that question, sorry. On how do we know what watt something they have? You want to come off so mute? Like a vacuum would have like 12 volt, you know, 12 um, amps. Mm -hmm. And, that, and I, we'd want to know like how, how much of a battery would be need to run that. So that's the that second formula I gave you there. So if it just gives you your amps, like it's a 12 amp battery, it runs at 120 volts, mm -hmm. then you would just use that second formula there to figure out what the wattage is. Uh, sorry, the first the first formula, I apologize. The amps times volts gives you your wattage. So if you have a 12 amp battery at 120 volts, what is that, 1440? I think it's 1440 uh, watts. 
So that would tell you if I'm using a, a per hour. So if I'm using a vacuum for an hour, it's going to discharge uh, 1440 um, watts. I've got a question. Is yep. 100 watts always 12 volts? No, that's a very good question. So inside of our homes, there's two different type of voltages that we norm. Well, let me take that back. Inside of our home, there's a lot of different type of voltages we use. Outlets in our home normally use either 120 volts or 220 volts, and they look different. So like your gas dryer will use 220, also called 240. Um, and a standard outlet would use 110, also called 120 volts. Um, so your normal outlets that you would plug a vacuum into is 120 volts, which is why I can say 12 amps times 120 volts. If you set a, a dryer, a, an electric dryer, that's 240 volts. So it would be whatever the amperage of the dryer is times 240 volts, and you would get your wattage for that, for that appliance. Um, pretty much everything in your home is standard except for your EV charger, your dryer, um, if you have like a air conditioner, like one of those big air conditioners, those also use 240 volts, but the plug is that big dryer plug. And that's an easy way. Thank you that you can distinguish it. And Crystal has a picture there. We'll put one in the last slide here for future reference as well. Uh, next slide, if there's no questions. Um, I just have a quick comment um, that should be very brief, if that's okay, or should I wait till the end? Uh, um, no, you can get a comment. Well, we will we move to the next slide. Yeah, I was just going to explain if people are interested, just the difference between the watts and the volts, if you're interested. So like watts is the rate of energy per second. So like how many, how much work it's doing per second, how like much it's able to do. Um, sometimes watt hours is useful, right? So how much work it's able to do in an hour. And then a voltage is actually like how fast the electrons are moving or like the difference in the, like like the, how the battery itself or the converter is structured. So I think that what might be useful is just understanding that a watt is a, is a measure of how much work is happening per second. And sometimes it's useful, like for an appliance, it might say a watt hour or how many watt hours, it will say like, how many hours can it work at this rate before dying, right? Or how much can how much work can it do for how many hours? Because seconds isn't as useful as hours before it dies. So I think it's been helpful for me to think about watts in terms of like power and work. And then voltage might be more so like, so you don't blow a fuse or like, it's less hard, it's harder to explain, but if anyone wants to talk about that more afterwards, I'm, I'm happy to to do like start discussion on Canva or, or talk about it in like a Thank you. And there's a lot of um a lot of YouTube's out there, a lot of information online, which is why we won't get into that. But your outlets at home, 120 is like jump roping with one rope and 240 is like double dutching. So you'll have actually two 120 strands and now you're double dutching with those. Um next slide. So thank you. The <laughs> question is, uh, what do these two places have in common? We're just gonna show you some pictures. And if anyone can guess, I'll be really, really happy. But um, we're gonna go through these slides. Each one's gonna be maybe five seconds. Um, if you can figure out where the first place is, it might help you figure out what these two places have in common. Go ahead. So just five seconds per slide. I keep moving? Yes, please. That's the first place. And I think the next one starts the second place. They're all near water. In the first place is London. I'll give you guys that. 
They're all solar powered. <laughs> Keep the guesses coming in. This is the last slide, right? Yes. You can leave it there. They're both rich in resources, I guess. Depending on how you see it. <laughs> so uh, the answer is, um, go back a slide. Uh, one more slide. That's a good one right there. So the answer is uh, uh, in Africa, they do mining for um, cobalt. Yeah. Uh, they also do mining for lithium as well. Um, cobalt and lithium are uh, both things that need to be mined out of the earth. Um, London, what London has in common with with where they mine these is the, the, the size of London is the size of uh, the picture that you see on your screen right now. So the entire city, this is what they've excavated out of the earth um, to create the batteries that we use in our electric vehicles, in our uh, cell phones, in our computers and so forth. Um, and it's something that's gonna continue. This is the new green you know, the green plan here. So just. Uh, Was that Imperial Valley that we saw by any chance? No, it was not Imperial Valley. This is all these are, are, are uh, photos in Africa. Uh, next one, actually, next one, next one. This is a, a picture of cobalt. Um, what it looks like when it comes out of the earth. Um, from there, it gets refined and it gets sent to a lot of different companies. All the companies are big names that everyone knows. Uh, so they can manufacture the batteries for EVs and, and so forth. Um, yeah, during this, uh, there's a couple of things that happens. Um, one, of course, the minerals are extracted from the earth. Uh, it's a very, not at all a green process. The amount of water that goes into the extraction process is crazy. Um, the amount of uh, people that die in this process is, is really crazy. The um, Actually, if you go back a slide, I think it might show like a village. Um, the neighborhoods that they take these minerals from. Yes, uh, sorry, Ford, Ford, Ford. Um, one more, one more. That one right there. If you look on the back one. If you look on the right side of this photo, there's a village right here. And then this is where the mining operation starts right to the left on the left side of the screen. The delineation is like a, a little fence, little rock fence that they put up between the two. Um, cobalt is uh, not uh, a clean mineral. It's um, it's a hazardous material. So it's it degrades the entire society that it gets extracted from. Um, normally, those societies, under normal circumstances, are compensated for their minerals. Um, except for kind of how they did things here in the United States. Uh, but the same thing is happening today. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, somebody just, Kelvin just dropped in the, um, the chat. Yes, this is the Congo, Republic of Congo. Congo. So um, they go, they extract material, they don't give anything back to uh, the society, the people that live in these places. Uh, and the reason why I'm pointing this out, thank you very much for the time check. The reason why I'm pointing this out is we can't talk about lithium batteries. We can, can't talk about green without actually understanding what's behind the scenes, what's going to continue to be behind the scenes until um, the greater population is educated and understands this is also what happens. This is not a far off thing. This is happening right now, right here today um, to, to give people the convenience of having a laptop to talk about these things on, which is really bizarre. But just want to make sure everyone's aware of that and just to bring that up. Someone had already dropped in um, a message when we were talking about batteries about this. So I just wanted to make sure we also included this. Um, we can get into deeper discussion, but right now we're going to have to move on to the next one. So it's making sure everyone's aware that this happens. Tons of resources on it. Google um, uh, cobalt blood. 
Um, and you can read thousands of articles. It's going to be the same thing, lithium blood as well. So I'll pass thank it you to you. for sharing that. Oh, thank you. I'll pass it to Kansas. Sure, yeah. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I almost feel like, and you guys can tell me if you just want to, we can, we can watch the video now and I could do the little segment or we could make that like little research or homework because it is a video. It covers most of the information about the do's and don'ts and best practices. If you guys want to move on to the more synthesizing what we've learned, I think we could just wrap up with that and then I can do a closing. How do you guys feel? I think you should go, go for your section. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So uh, just really quickly, we'll go into uh, just some stuff about um, main, maintenance of batteries um, and uh, the care of them. Uh, so sorry, Kansas. I just wanted to offer some buffer because I know this is a lot. This is a lot yeah. of <laughs> looking at these pictures a lot and just holding the contradiction is a lot. And knowing that our communities also have immediate needs. We cannot, like, we, we don't live in a perfect world. And of course, it'd be really, really nice if we can find a technology that helps solve that. But we also have people who need the medicine and the power is shutting off. The power lines are coming down, the heat keeps rising. There were 1 million people without power just last night from a storm and people are being killed just from a storm right now happening at this moment. And this is just natural disaster. We're not even talking about the social disaster that's constantly happening. The compounded things is constantly happening. So um, we have to navigate the contradiction around how do we then use these tools in a way that actually builds power instead of affirm the system that kills us, affirm the system that kills the planet. So right now we're gonna go into the battery management and care to think about now, if we have this, we don't want to waste it. We understand there's a lot of contradictions we're holding. So let's get to understand how do we take care of it? And that's what Kansas is gonna jump right in to let us know. Cool, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so thank you everyone actually for all of your feedback and great participation and uh, the transfer of information here. Um, so just really quickly, I just good kind of talking about good ways to care and maintain for the batteries. So mostly you're, we're talking about maintaining, keeping the battery as charged as possible. Uh, making sure its voltage is as high as possible so that when you do need to use the battery, it's in the best condition and obviously has the most energy and can perform the best uh, when it needs when it needs to. Um, a lot of things that like don't look uh, like to not do are very commonsensical, but just to say them, you know, don't leave the batteries out in the rain, make sure they're in a protected shelter, secured, and um, yeah, uh, for different types of batteries, such as lead acid, you obviously don't want to make sure they're on their side. They contain uh, liquid in them, and that can actually spill or drain. So you want to be uh, wary of that. Um, and again, I, these are just general tips, but I can say a lot of stuff, but a lot of it has been put into this video by other collective members, and a lot of work has been put into this. So I would like to transition to that now. Actually, let me make sure we have the sound function. I'm not sure if I have that set up. My apologies. I should no have done that. So sound. Um, there you go. You're experiencing an emergency with your power supply and that, that sucks. We're here with an easy to use portable battery that you can set up in three simple steps. Before we get started, let's quickly go over the three main components of the battery system. First, this is the lead acid battery that stores the energy that will be used by the system. This over here is the AC wall charger. This component lets us charge the battery via a standard AC power outlet found in most homes. The cord should be labeled for your convenience. Lastly, the inverter converts our stored DC power into usable household AC power. This is the component that makes it possible for us to draw power from the battery system. Now let's move on. 
Here's how to quickly verify if the battery is ready to use. First, check here to see if the battery is full. Not all batteries are alike, so look for the voltage reader on your inverter. Most are full at 12.7 volts. If less than 12.5 volts, please contact the collector. Once you've verified the above, turn on the inverter. Using the battery is easy. Just plug your device into the outlet here. Heaters, electric kettles, microwaves, and other high voltage devices will drain the battery faster. So think of it as only for essentials like phone, computer, or refrigerator. How to charge the battery. Make sure the inverter is turned to off. Plug the charging cable into any standard working outlet in your home. Once plugged in, an LED light or other visual display will indicate charging. Charging will take several hours. The battery should be fully charged and ready to go at 12.7 volts. Thank you for being part of the Battery Collective. Power on. Awesome. Thank you for that. So yeah, a brief recap of what we, we talked about. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for your stuff. I will hand it back to Yasir uh, to help us fully recap on what we've also learned. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention today. Sorry, it was a bunch of, a uh, lot of uh, dense things. Tried to make sure everyone was prepared for that up front, but um, I would like more time to talk about uh, some of the social ramifications. Uh, I'm not sure if after today would, after right now, since class is over, <laughs> if 10 minutes maybe after today would be convenient or not, but um, I will offer that if anyone wants to. Um, and then aside from that, yeah, we talked today about uh, batteries, um, just gave an overview on uh, and what amp hours are, what watt hours are, um, how to look at that and determine what size uh, a battery bank you would need um, for any type of off-grid use. Um, also, we talked about some social issues regarding the new clean uh, lithium batteries. Uh, when you look them up, um, the majority of the websites that you look at are going to say how great they are and how this is the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, understand they do have drawbacks. Um, and trying to find the balance of uh, what we need. I'll say need like this. Um, and you know what we're using just to be conscious of those things, to be able to speak about them intelligently, um, just to make sure everyone else is also um, observant of those things as well. A lot of the bigger organizations are not uh, being held accountable because uh, you have two folds. One, you have people who don't care, and you have other people who don't know enough to care. So I think if individuals know and see what's going on, um, and if you just do a, a very little bit of scratching, just Google it and it pops up. It's not being hidden. It's not very deep into anything. You don't have to do like a multi-level click. It'll come right up and you'll see like the atrocities that are happening to get people um, lithium to, to, to have those inside of vehicles. So um, yeah, so I think we would be beside ourselves if we said community and not include the fact that globally we are a community. This planet is a shared resource that everyone is sharing. Um, water is a very depleting resource, um, non-renewable. Uh, a lot of people think water is renewable, but water is not renewable whatsoever. Um, after you toxify water to extract uh, minerals, you can't purify that water anymore. So that water is lost. Um, so yeah, I think that's all we have. What else did we go over? We also went over battery usage and maintenance. Um, that video link has been shared in the chat. So if you guys want to look at that again, uh, you're welcome to. And I think that's all we have. Thank you everyone for joining. Sorry, we ran over today. Um, and if anyone wants to talk about anything, we have about another four minutes for questions. Yeah. Thank you for dropping that in chat, Tom. Oh. Hopefully everyone can see that, but if you want to also speak about it right now, it's probably a good time because I don't see any questions. Yeah, just say, uh, 
just going to say very quickly that um, we have another educational opportunity coming up at Shareable uh, for those that are interested. Um, we're partnering with, as I put in the chat, with Next Econ with the Lyft Economy for their Next Economy MBA program, which is a, a nine month program, um, and it's normally about five thousand dollars to participate in their MBA, uh, five to six. Um, but we've got a free seat, um, so there's you can click on the link there to apply, and there's also um, this inf more information has been posted into um, onto Canva or Canvas, excuse me. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And we'll leave you with a takeaway question too, like we always do, and we'll post this on Canvas. And that is, we want you guys to think about, you know, what is your community's minimum and maximum battery battery capacity requirement? So start to think about who's in your community and what energy needs they actually need and how what we learned about today can be help you think about and understand the wattage types of components needed. Appreciate all of you coming out. And yeah, we'll continue to open it up for, I think, free discussion for a bit. And for next week, same time, same day on Tuesday, we're going to have session four going into infrastructure and logistics. We're going to be exploring the infrastructure and logistic aspect of establishing and operating a battery collective. We're going to talk about triaging. We're going to talk about all sorts of things and how we're going to make that happen. So you don't want to miss out. We'll see you next week. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got this. We're going to be navigating the contradictions if we have each other. This has been great. Thank you so much. Thank you for making Thanks for us your this. message, Stephanie. <laughs> Peace, y'all. Cool. Yeah, no worries. Uh, we had a question. Where do you buy your batteries? Do we want to answer that or? Yeah, Eliza's still here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, so for us, we bought our batteries. Most of them are very, actually almost all of them, all of them are DIY. So we bought them just in different auto zone, auto shops, um, for auto parts. Some of them are online. Um, we can also get some po components from Ace Hardware, just like local hardware store. And then we just DIY and put it all together. That's how we did it at the People Power Battery Collective. And if you're getting lead acid batteries, uh, any like auto junkyard is a great place to get low cost ones there as well. We actually, um, similar to what Yasir was saying, we actually bought a refurbished batteries. Um, the lead acid batteries were all refurbished. Mostly because it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> the used ones are much cheaper. But of course we care about it. Um, who refurbishes battery? Like auto junkyard, you can get it from, just go to the auto junkyard and just buy it from the junkyard. Yeah. <laughs> or there's going to be some auto parts that does that too they would just go to junkyard for you but obviously it's going to be more expensive because they go to the junkyard for you instead of you doing this yourself yeah if you have any connection with the hospital hospitals get rid of their lithium batteries uh kind of often as well so the batteries that they use in their medical devices um they have standards for use so their standards are based off of the old batteries like uh um like older batteries, it haven't, hasn't been changed to lithium batteries. So a lot of the devices use lithium batteries now. So the old standard was every year or every two years, they have to cycle out their batteries just because they don't want a device to, to die while it's using, you know, while a patient's using it. So they still cycle out the lithium batteries on the same time frame. So if you know someone that works in a hospital, talk to their maintenance person, they have usually have a, a, a glut of those that they'll resell like on eBay or something like that. But those are great batteries to, to grab if you can uh, if you can get those because they're lithium batteries. They're already extracted from the earth. Um, so reusing or repurposing those would be a good thing.
what type